The Strange Disappearance of Eric Sears On July 14, 2004, friends and recent graduates of Carlsbad High School in California, 17-year-olds Eric Sears and Ben Fogelstrom, decided to go on a camping trip together in Joshua Tree National Park. The two of them showed up to their campsite in Jumbo Rocks and were just having a good time. They were turned away from the San Jacinto due to wildfires. Around noon is when investigators believe the two boys became separated. Teams of searchers were told that Eric became dehydrated and Ben went to go and find some water. Eric stayed behind and curled up underneath a picnic bench to try and rest in the shade until Ben returned. When Ben came back, he couldn't find Eric anywhere and became panicked. Some other campers came across him, how is still unclear, and brought him into the park office to report the disappearance of Eric at around 4.40 the next afternoon. The search of a 20-square-mile area of the park began at 6 p.m. that evening. There was an intensive search and rescue operation. The park's SAR team scoured the area with help from various law enforcement teams, and as of Sunday, there were 170 searchers in total. But by Monday, the number of searchers had dropped to 40 because the volunteers had to return to work. The search included tracking dogs, horses, a helicopter, fixed-wing planes, and climbers who looked in rock crevices where he could have fallen. Robert Fonda, one of the park's lead trackers, said the search was difficult because it had taken place in 100-plus degree heat every day and because the terrain varied from really flat to boulder outcroppings where the footing is perilous. He stated, We've been working a lot in the back areas and making sure that some teams didn't miss anything. You can't speculate about what may have happened. You just have to search. Searchers did find some of Eric's shoe prints, and the dogs were able to pick up his scent, but none of it enabled them to determine where he was going. Eric was described as in top physical condition. He ran cross-country for four years in high school and even traveled to Australia two years earlier with other state runners. As an adult, he also participated in a 24-hour relay race between Carlsbad and El Camino High Schools at Carlsbad, July 10th and 11th to promote the sport and help raise money. Unfortunately, all would not end well. Eric's body was found on July 23rd. The cause of death couldn't be determined by autopsy because that time it was too badly decomposed. There was no obvious trauma found anywhere on the body. This is when the investigators turned to the only person who was with them that night for answers. The rest of the story, as told by Ben to the authorities, is strange to say the least. Here's what Ben said had happened leading up to the disappearance, though he admitted to authorities during this statement that he was having trouble distinguishing what actually happened from hallucinations. He was certain he was having due to his and Eric's partaking in a wildly grown illicit but not illegal in the state of California substance the night before. His report was oftentimes conflicting and all over the place. He told authorities both he and Eric had drank a tea made from a certain weed. He claimed he remembered speaking to a bush, an Indian, and possibly to Eric. He said he was pretty sure his friend was deceased because he thought he remembered disposing of his body. He also couldn't tell authorities exactly how Eric had gone missing or ended up deceased, depending on which story Ben was recounting at the time. However, two chemicals, toxins, found in this plant were found in Eric's brain tissue. One way or another, the use of this plant by Ben and Eric was a major contributing factor in Eric's death. The plant, known as Jimson weed, loco weed, stink weed, mad apple, thorn apple, are among the street names for the foul-smelling Datura stramonium plant. It is one of a group of plants known as belladonnas. Datura stramonium is a common weed found along roadsides, in cornfields, pastures, and waste areas. It's been reported to grow widely in all but two states, Wyoming and Alaska. Although it's not popular on the street, it is usually used by teenagers curious about the plant's hallucinogenic and euphoric effects. Although it's something adolescents might use with their peers, all parts of the plant are toxic and usage can result in serious illness or death. It can take up to hours for someone to feel the plant's effects, so people often consume excessive amounts believing it's not working. Since it's growing wild, the potency is impossible to predict. The toxicity even varies by year between plants, parts of the plant, and even among different leaves on the same plant. Even just a small amount of it ingested can cause nausea, headache, severe agitation, hallucinations, behavioral changes, and or delirium. 
Annually, poison control centers deal with approximately 1,000 cases of poisoning by these plants. Usage increases between May and September when the plants are mature and plentiful. The overwhelming majority of users report that their experience was very unpleasant, physically dangerous, and sometimes terrifying. Few people ever use it twice. Even a one-time usage can have tragic effects, such as in this case. With all that being said, one may ask, what is the lure to experiment with a plant which seems to have no pleasant effects whatsoever? The effects have been described as being in a living dream and can last for days. It has extremely powerful psychoactive effects, including hallucinations, delusions, disorientation, confusion, and panic. Doesn't sound like my idea of fun. Users have no concept that anything they are talking to, seeing, or running from isn't actually there. That's how intense these hallucinations can be, where it's impossible to distinguish them from reality. Oddly enough, some of the hallucinations are reported to have recurrent themes, such as insects, cigarettes, people, or objects appearing and disappearing, including demons and monsters. Smoking a phantom cigarette is one of the most common hallucinations, even if the individual has never smoked before. Talking to inanimate objects, plants, and friends who are not present is also frequently reported. Individuals lose their ability to identify their friends and may not even recognize their own reflection in a mirror. The individual may also try to interact with these hallucinations. Most users don't even realize that they're hallucinating until its effects wear off. Amnesia is also frequently reported, with users having no memory of what they were doing for several hours or they may unconsciously replace fact with fantasy. They can fall in and out of conscious, slip into delirium. It's believed that this is what happened with Eric and Ben while they were out being typical teenagers that night in Joshua Tree. Did they get in over their heads and one thing lead to another? Did Eric die of an overdose from taking too much, thinking the initial doses weren't effective or not working for him? Or was it something else altogether? Unfortunately, Jimson Weed's related deaths are often a result of impaired judgment that leads to risk-taking activities, such as believing you can fly and jumping off a cliff or chasing a mermaid in a lake, even though you can't swim. Are the above listed are nowhere near all the dangerous effects this particular belladonna could have on the human brain and psyche. So what happened to Eric Sirius that fateful night in 2004, when he had his whole life ahead of him and was just looking to have some fun with his friend in a beautiful place? the celebration of the huge life milestone of graduating high school. Eric was described by his peers as popular and friendly, and as mentioned before, was a member of the cross-country team. He had been accepted into the engineering program at San Diego State University and was to begin classes that fall. His death affected the whole community. According to an affidavit filed at Superior Court in Indio, he provided several stories of hallucinating during the night, with he being Ben Fogelstrom. The community was heartbroken with the discovery of Eric's body and with the seeming senselessness of it on top of it all. On the porch of the Sears home, signs with messages of hope, flowers, and red and white and blue candles formed what was to be a welcome for the family when they returned. Parents Tom and Wendy Sears have remained at the desert campground since shortly after their son was reported missing. Officials said the Sears family was in seclusion Friday night in nearby 29 Palms, and that their daughter, Stephanie, age 19, was en route to join them. Many were expected to return later in the evening to share prayers and light candles against the darkness at the Sears' home, something they have done night after night this week. Neighbors and friends said the mutual support provided by the small, close community has at times been the only thing that carried them through more than a week of waiting. Groups of neighbors have traveled daily to Joshua Tree to help support the family. There was a search warrant issued for Ben's home in hopes of uncovering more information. According to this affidavit, investigators did give him a lie detector test, but we know that these are faulty and not admissible in most courts. This was while searchers were still looking for Eric in the Joshua Tree Park. According to the affidavit, Ben tearfully admitted during an interview with detectives that he found Eric dead inside his tent. He said that happened the day he reported his friend is missing. This is also where he admitted to disposing of Eric's body by putting it inside an outhouse toilet at their campsite. But, according to the affidavit, that's when he wanted to stop talking to investigators and then change the story altogether. Investigators say he later denied dumping Eric's body in an outhouse and said 
that's not where I put him. Investigators did indeed check several parked toilets, but searchers eventually found Eric's body lying in the middle of the desert, about three miles from the Jumbo Rocks campground. Sheriff's investigators tried hard to corroborate what Ben told them about what happened while they were at the campsite, before, during, and after they had consumed the plant. Whatever information was given to us in the affidavit, investigators are looking into it and looking at every scenario in the affidavit, they said. But despite statements Ben apparently made in this affidavit, the Sheriff's Department said he was not a suspect in the death. They did say that he is still a focus of their investigation as they try to figure out exactly how the 17-year-old ended up dead in the desert at Joshua Tree. No one was ever charged with anything in relation to the death of Eric Sears, and so much of what happened remains a mystery. To make matters worse, and even more sad, two San Bernardino County Sheriff's Search and Rescue volunteers on their way to help search for Eric, a 35-year-old man named Joseph Tidwell from Wonder Valley, who was allegedly under the influence of several narcotic substances, lost consciousness due to his intoxication, causing his truck to drift across the roadway directly into the path of the sheriff's van. Scott Johnson, 30, of Redlands, died at the scene. Philip Calvert, 58, of Mentone, was transported to Desert Regional Medical Center with major injuries and sadly died early the next morning. Although this harmful plant isn't scheduled under the Controlled Substances Act, three states, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Tennessee, at this time, have passed legislation to control it. In addition, the FDA has asserted that the belladonna alkaloids in this plant are neither safe nor effective in over-the-counter or other cough and cold inhalants. So be careful what you put into your body. Hello, friends. In this video, I'm going to take a look at Devil's Hole and the tragic disappearance of two teens in 1965. Now, there's just something about a place with the name Devil in its title that piques the curiosity of some people. There are countless locations all over the world which have this particular word in their name. Not only devil either, there are many other words that symbolize or mean devil or evil or some other form of something not very good or beautiful given, somewhat ironically, to some of the world's most breathtaking and wondrous places. Sometimes the location will have gotten its name innocently enough, such as because the geology of the place simply looks foreboding and sinister especially under the cover of night. Much of the time, these particular places are said to be cursed, enchanted, or downright evil, and the spooky and scary landscape only lends credence to these rumors and legends. So much of the time, though, these places with this particular word in the title are associated with not just devils, demons, spirits, and other otherworldly phenomena, but with real tragedies, disappearances, deaths, maybe bizarre sounds and strange lights in the sky. Today, though, we're going to focus on one place in particular, where a mysterious tragedy struck. Devil's Hole, which is located in the aptly named Death Valley National Park in California, United States. This portion of the Mojave Desert, contained in Death Valley National Park, is the driest and hottest place in the United States. Near Badwater, in the long trench of the desert between the Panamint Range on the west and the Black Mountains on the east is the lowest dry land in the western hemisphere. An amazing 282 feet below sea level. A veritable showcase of desert extremes, Death Valley National Park includes one of the largest salt pans on Earth. Dramatically faulted landscapes, young volcanic craters, and massive dune fields. Today, we're going all the way back to the year 1965. Death Valley was very different from the Los Angeles of the time, where there were uprisings happening all over the place and all of it being shown live on the evening news. Death Valley, California, was in one of the least populated parts of the state at the time, and a whole different world than the more largely inhabited cities which surrounded it. On June 20th, 1965, Four high school buddies set out to a remote desert location about 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Their intent was to joy dive into a deep geothermal abyss called Devil's Hole. Sadly, 
two of the young men would never reemerge from this mysterious fossil water portal. Arriving at their destination, the foursome hiked up a hot, barren hillside, which overlooked a large-scale ranching operation that would nearly erase a much smaller and nearly ancient complex called Ash Meadows within a few short years. A well-traveled trail led to the entrance of a limestone chasm that had allegedly opened a whopping 60,000 years ago after possibly some seismic event caused the roof of the cave to collapse in on itself. The foursome of boys, which was made up of Paul Giancontari, a 19-year-old cafeteria worker at the nearby Nevada test site, his new brother-in-law, 20-year-old David Rose, who was a Las Vegas casino parking attendant, were with their other friend, 19-year-old Bill Alter, and his younger brother Jack. Boys scrambled under a fenced enclosure posted with warning signs, and thinking they were immune to any trouble these warning signs might be posted about, they proceeded to descend the thirty or so feet down to a ledge, where the faint but flitting movement of tiny blue-gray pupfish could be observed swimming in the eight-by-sixty-foot pool. That is, if any of the four young men had bothered to look just a bit closer at what they were about to jump into. After suiting up with scuba tanks, masks, and dive lights, Paul, David, and Bill dove into the claustrophobic waters. The temperature was nearly indistinguishable from that of their skin. Upon entering the pool, the boys most likely disturbed the delicate algae spawning mats where the entire population of the exceedingly rare Cyprinodon diabolus continues to prosper and breed exclusively. Jack was the only one who hadn't jumped in, as he was delegated the one who would remain stationed on the ledge in case anything went wrong. Sometime after midnight, Paul failed to resurface, so David and Bill quickly redove into the waters in a vain attempt to locate their missing friend. Bill Alter frantically followed David Rose down to approximately 170 feet until David, too, disappeared into the darkness. The bodies of the brothers-in-law were never recovered. Many people believed back then, and still do believe, that these young men were inspired to go diving at night despite the dangers in this specific place because of a newspaper article from the year before which detailed a speleological research expedition of a massive underground lake below Death Valley, led by California-based professional diver Jim Houts, who would ironically dive numerous times around the clock with military personnel and other volunteer divers in their attempt to locate the missing men for 36 whole hours until the search was eventually called off. The only traces left of the two brother-in-laws? A mask and a snorkel. There was also a flashlight tied to a ledge some hundred feet below. It seemed to signal, ineffectively, the way out of the otherworldly underwater cave system. Articles detailing the unsuccessful rescue effort were published nationwide. In the Sarasota Journal, dated June 22, 1965, Out stated that he had previously dived in Devil's Hole around 300 times over 28 trips. Further commenting, It's beautiful in there. It goes straight down 160 feet, like a pipe, then opens into a room that is about 300 feet long and maybe 40 feet wide. The bottom of the room is about 260 feet down, then it narrows into another tube. I dive to 315 feet, maybe that's a record, I don't know, but at the end of the tube it opens again into something else. We don't know what the next room is, or if it's a room at all. It's like infinity. There are some very terrifying legends from the native tribes of the area about this particular place called Devil's Hole. The Timbasha told tales of water babies who would surface and swallow a swimmer or diver whole should they stay in the pool for too long. Other legends suggested that So Apitzi, a legendary malevolent giant who dwelled at mountain springs and caves, would snatch and devour unwary victims. Myths withstanding, Barbara Durham, an elder of the Timbisha Shoshone, who shared these stories at a 2002 workshop, admitted that she and her friends enjoyed how the pupfish tickled their toes when they played in the spring. Keep in mind here that the Devil's Hole pupfish, as they are specifically named, are considered by experts to be the rarest fish found anywhere on the planet. They were even the first ever species to be classified as endangered. 
The fish are not important to the story at all, really, but it seemed worth mentioning in order to reinforce how very special and perhaps a bit magical this place actually is. As far as the two young men who disappeared without a trace back in this mystical and extremely dangerous underwater cave system decades ago, well, they've never been found, and neither have any clues relating to what could have possibly happened to them. As for one more bit of interesting fact that could lend a bit of credence to something a bit more sinister being afoot, as the local tribes absolutely believe, at this otherwise serene and tranquil-looking water source, it's said that Charles Manson himself spent several days at Devil's Hole, trying to figure out a way to make it safely down into the chasm, with some saying he was convinced he would never have to come back up. Allegedly, he had an obsession with the place, and was convinced that there was an underwater portal to an alternate dimension, or more specifically, a portal to the underworld, where he felt he and his family would be able to safely wait out the coming apocalypse he so famously predicted would happen that never actually did. Charles Manson's problem lie in figuring out a way to drain the hole, and it seemed like he may have been given this idea by an alleged Indian legend that resurfaced during the 1920s, contending that a subterranean sect of leather-clad humanoids lived down within an eerily yellow-green lit abode somewhere in the Mojave Desert. It says Bill planned on leaving the park before dark, and when she still hadn't heard from him by Friday morning, she called rangers who launched a search effort that's grown. An incredible story of survival. A hiker survived five days alone out in Joshua Tree. It all started on the last week of December in 2012. My mother and I were relaxing after work, watching TV, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed movement in our hallway. When I turned to look, I noticed two shadowy-like figures that appeared on our hallway wall. In disbelief of what I was seeing, I turned my head over towards my mother, and right as I did, she made eye contact with me and simply said, You see them, don't you? I said yes. She told me not to acknowledge them because they're entities that can sense fear. But in disbelief, I looked back over at the hallway wall, and they were gone. A few days had gone by, and my mother told me she felt a sense of dread and said someone in our family is going to pass away before the end of the year. Well, on New Year's Eve, 2012, my mother and I celebrated at home. We watched the movie Tron and had a pizza delivered to ring in the New Year. I've always been a real mama's boy, so this was an ideal way for me to spend my New Year's Eve. Around 11 p.m. that night, we saw the two figures again. This time, we both experienced an overwhelming quietness and sense of urgency and dread. We both did our best to ignore it, and eventually the shadowy figures and the senses went away. We discussed the experience, and again my mother told me to never acknowledge them, and before I could press her for more details, my mother started telling me how much I meant to her, and that I would go on to do great things in my life. She loved me, etc. She then got up and walked towards the kitchen, turned around and said, I love you, then fell to the ground. I had previous EMT training and am certified in CPR, so I dialed 911 and explained to them my mother is in cardiac arrest and I needed medical assistance ASAP. I was doing CPR on my mother for nearly 20 minutes, and for anyone who's ever done CPR, it's not easy. The EMTs arrived at 11.38 p.m., and my mother was taken to the emergency room. By this time, our neighbor and friend Bonnie had rushed over to my house and drove me to the hospital. When I checked in at the front desk, I was taken to a small private room, and the head physician told me that my mother had passed away. The autopsy showed my mother suffered from a fatal heart attack, and her time of death was 11.59 p.m. on December 31, 2012. When I was taken in to see her one last time, her lips were blue and she was cool to the touch, but she was still my mom, so I just hugged her and couldn't let go for nearly 30 minutes. Thankfully, my neighbor Bonnie was there and gave me plenty of support and encouragement to leave as my mother would want me to stay strong. Fast forward to about six months after my mother died. I'd quit my job and had become a recluse. I would only leave my house to purchase groceries. I quickly realized how severely depressed I was and decided it was time to get away. I ended up traveling to Joshua Tree National Park and decided it would be my getaway to find some peace and closure. 
I notified my neighbor Bonnie not to worry that I'm just going on a day's hike and would be back by midnight. When I arrived at Joshua Tree, I parked my Jeep and entered the Lost Palms Oasis Trail. After a few hours of walking and hiking, I stopped to take a break and eat. As I finished up and looked around, nothing looked familiar, and I in fact was not on any trail. I was not too worried and felt confident I would find my way back, but as I made my way through the desert landscape that I did not recall ever passing, I started feeling like I was being watched. I started to panic. Then I started hearing strange growling noises, but could not determine from what direction they were coming from. It almost seemed like they were all around me. So I stood in one spot and made a 360 degree rotation. As I came to a stop, I saw something transparent, no defining shape, just a blur directly in front of me that was coming closer and closer to where I was standing. I quickly turned around and started walking faster and faster in the opposite direction, and then experienced the same overwhelming quietness and sense of urgency and dread I had experienced with my mother just six months prior. Then all of a sudden, almost like a snap of a finger, daytime turned into night. I wasn't sure what was going on, but knew something wasn't right. After walking around in the dark, I found myself by a large rock, about as big as a large SUV, and felt safest there. I put my back against the rock. This way I felt nothing would sneak up behind me. I used the night to hydrate and eat some snacks I brought. I remember trying to make sense out of what I was experiencing, but knew that my mother and I had already experienced something within our own home. But at least when I was home, I felt safe. Here, I was vulnerable and alone. As I tried to rest that night, I started seeing a number of shadowy entities walking around in the desert, almost as if they were wandering around aimlessly. It freaked me out, and the more I acknowledged them, the closer they got to me. At one time during the night, I remember feeling something breathing down my neck. Remember, my back was against a huge rock. I just closed my eyes and did my best to keep them shut. The last thing I remember about that night was opening my eyes and seeing three shadowy figures, one at each side and one directly in front of me. Then once again, in a snap, it was morning. I would experience the same weirdness for two more days until the last day. On the last day of me roaming around Joshua Tree, I hadn't had any food or water since the initial first night. I was scared and dehydrated. I came upon another large rock and remembered in my EMT training that digging a hole near a rock in the desert will keep you cool and less likely to get severe sunburn. I did just that and thought to myself, I'm literally digging my own grave. By the time I laid down in the two-foot arched hole I'd made and covered my chest and legs up with dirt, I blacked out. I don't remember anything for the rest of that day or night. The next morning, I was woken by an off-duty search and rescue employee who was literally making me choke on water. I remember him saying, There are a whole lot of people out looking for you, buddy. I was picked up by helicopter and taken to Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California. In the days during my recovery, I saw two detectives, a number of psychiatrists, and my neighbor Bonnie, who was there at the hospital by my side 100% of the way. The detectives wanted to close the missing persons report my neighbor Bonnie made the second day I was missing, but they asked me strange questions like, was I using a flare gun in the area? No. And why had I purchased a large amount of camping gear and survival materials prior to my hike? I'm going for a hike. Strange questions to ask someone, or maybe it's just me. The physician stated he thought I was planning to kill myself due to the loss of my mother, but honestly, that never crossed my mind. The psychiatrist told me I didn't experience anything but hallucinations due to the lack of food and water and effects of dehydration. My neighbor Bonnie overheard my story and later confided in me that she too experienced similar shadowy figures when she hiked in Joshua Tree. When I arrived back home, she used sage and other new age methods to rid my house of whatever darkness was there. However, it continued all the way up until my move to Tennessee in 2014. By far the most aggressive was the transparent entities that were in Joshua Tree. I felt like everything was about to end when I encountered them. I've always wondered if my mother experienced more than what happened that night. I'm not sure what the hell happened those few days in Joshua Tree National Park, but from what I can remember, during the moments when daytime would turn into night in a snap, 
I felt like I was falling down or being suspended in midair before completely realizing what was going on. I also remember a strong urge to go to Joshua Tree. I would think about going all the time, and when I finally went, I almost felt like I was being called there by something. My sister often talks about my first week living in Tennessee. She said that she felt like a demon was attached to me. One night as I slept on her couch, I woke up with her putting holy water on my head and saying a prayer over me. But I don't believe in all that. I used to. But nowadays, I have an easier time believing in alien abductions and portals rather than being followed around by a demon. But then again, who knows, right? Finally, I can tell you with 100% honesty, I experienced all of the above. I can't explain what it or what they were, but I can tell you I feel like my life was spared for some strange reason. Perhaps I didn't meet the requirements for whatever it is they need. Looking back now, I would never have gone hiking alone. But again, I remember this irresistible urge to go to Joshua Tree and would frequently feel like I was being called there. Hiking tragedy on one of our most popular mountain peaks. A woman from out of state dying after trying to hike Camelback Mountain. Fire officials say she became overheated on the Echo Canyon Trail, but instead of waiting for rescue crews, she went to find help herself. Then a deadly discovery. Her body later found near the mountain right outside a home. A woman found dead near Camelback Mountain was hiking with a Phoenix cop. And tonight we know the woman's name is Angela Tremonti, a 31 year old visiting from Boston. She was found dead Friday after separating from that cop to turn back down the mountain in the summer heat. And she thought he, because he was a police officer, she was safe and she wasn't. I sent him the address where it was. It took them three hours to find her. And when I talked to Dario that night and asked him, when was the last time you saw my daughter? He said six hours ago, so not July. The police may not be investigating this, but I won't stop. I will not stop. There is something missing that I, as a mother, cannot put my finger on. Hello, friends. Today, we're going to bring you a strange story about a first date hike that resulted in a young woman's death. 31-year-old Angela Tremonte was visiting Phoenix, Arizona for the first time when she and a local police officer named Dario Dizdar decided to go on a hike for their first date. The couple went to Echo Canyon Trail near Scottsdale, Arizona. Echo Canyon Trail is a 2.5-mile heavily trafficked out-and-back trail that offers scenic views and beautiful landscapes. The trail is rated as difficult, but Angela and Dario weren't concerned as it was later reported that Dario was extremely familiar with the mountain and hiked that exact trail often. According to reports, they started hiking together around 10 a.m. with no water but split up. Dario, an off-duty police officer, stated that he was a local and did this hike all the time and that she was going to go as far as she could and turn around, according to an incident report filed by an unnamed park ranger. Now, according to what Dario told the authorities, he and Angela were going for a day hike together for their first date on July 30th. He reported that she became overheated when they were about halfway up the trail and told him she was going to head back down to the car. Dario went ahead to finish the hike, assuming he would just meet her back at the vehicle when he was done. Angela wanted him to take pictures of the view from the top of the mountain so she could share them on her social media accounts. He finished his hike, but when he got back down to the car, Angela wasn't there and wasn't anywhere in sight. Her belongings were still in the car, however, and this is when Dario's police officer instincts kicked in and he decided to report it to the authorities that his date was missing. Park ranger spoke with him on the mountain and the search commenced immediately. Search teams arrived and began looking around common areas on the mountain where people can get off the trail and get lost. More than 30 fire personnel and a police helicopter scoured the region, looking for the missing woman. Initially, authorities were suspicious of Dario, because they thought his initial statement was changing the more he retold what happened that day. However, it was later realized that he had been misquoted by local news media and therefore misunderstood. A Phoenix police spokesperson stated that the police department was not informed as to what the park rangers and officials had already asked Dario about the incident. Angela Tremonte was originally from the Boston area and was visiting Phoenix for the first time specifically to meet and go on a date with Dario. 
they had met and been chatting online, mainly by Instagram. It was less than 24 hours from her arrival that Angela went missing and was then found deceased. Around 4.40 p.m., Cruz found Tremonte unconscious near a home along the side of the mountain. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Police say no traumatic injuries were observed during the initial investigation or during the autopsy. Police say Tremonte had her cell phone with her when she was found. Fire officials involved in the search stated they believe she was trying to signal to someone in the homes there near the mountain to get some help. She must have known she was in trouble, but most likely had no cell service to call anyone for help herself. At this time, there is no evidence to indicate foul play is suspected in connection with her tragic death. Police say Dario Dizdar has been granted personal time off and has been offered resources to deal with this tragedy. According to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's website, Angela died of environmental heat exposure. Her death was ruled accidental by local and park authorities. Angela Tremonte's friends set up a GoFundMe account to bring her body back to the Boston area. Angela's mother, however, isn't satisfied with the medical examiner's findings. She's looking for answers after her daughter's cause of death was ruled to be from accidental heat exposure. I'm frustrated, said Nancy Tremonte, Angela's mother. My daughter was an Instagram person. She posted everything, thousands of photos per day, and she was always in the picture. And there's not one picture of her going up the mountain or even in Arizona, she said. None of it makes sense. But as we said... Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office did recently list Tremonte's death as accidental and as a result of heat exposure. Phoenix Police had previously stated investigators didn't find anything suspicious about Tremonte's death. However, Tremonte's family and friends have had suspicions about the circumstances surrounding her death all along, especially since the off-duty police officer claimed he and Tremonte didn't bring any water with them on a hike in the middle of the summer. Angela's cousin doesn't believe it. It's difficult because we're all mourning her, but we can't fall back and be sad about the situation. We all have to fight, said Gabriel Matuccio, Angela's cousin. Angela was found deceased in a backyard off the trail. Investigators believe she was in a desperate search for water. Speaking about traveling to Arizona to meet the officer, she was excited but nervous, said her cousin. She also made it a point to drink a whole gallon of water every day so it's very hard to believe that she would go on a hike in Arizona where it was 104 degrees and not take any water. Autopsy reports recently released by the County Medical Examiner's Office show no major irregularities that were uncovered that would indicate Tremonte's death could be tied to something other than heat exhaustion. A toxicology report did show that Tremonte had traces of amphetamine in her system, although her family told 12 News she had a prescription for Adderall, which can produce high levels of amphetamine in the blood. Tremonte had 350 nanograms per milliliter of amphetamine in her system at the time of her death. According to the report, adults who fatally overdose on amphetamine have, on average, 9,000 nanograms per milliliter in their system. The autopsy report additionally turned up irregular linear dried red abrasions on Tremonte's body that ranged in size between 4 and 10 centimeters. An examination of her head and neck revealed no detectable abnormalities, according to the report. The report also stated that Tremonte's bone framework and soft tissues also appeared normal. Phoenix police have previously said investigators didn't find anything suspicious about Tremonte's death. They further indicated no disciplinary measures will be taken against Dario because no crime has been found. Hello friends, today we're going to take a look at legends, disappearances, and stories of survival in Joshua Tree National Park, California. Now, Joshua Tree National Park is home to a vast and protected land located in Southern California. The area was first designated as a national monument in 1936 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was later given national park status in 1994 when the United States Congress passed the California Desert Protection Act. The park spans more than 790,000 acres and over half is reserved as wilderness. The park is well known for the tree that inspired its name, the Joshua Tree. 
Scientifically, it's known as the Yucca brevifolia and is a member of the agave family. Joshua trees grow in a wide variety of formations, from thin and sparsely placed to thick and crowded forests. According to the National Park Service, of the mid-19th century, Mormon immigrants had made their way across the Colorado River and into the area that is now the National Park. Legend has it that these pioneers named the tree after the biblical figure Joshua, seeing the limbs of the tree as outstretched in supplication, guiding the travelers westward. Joshua Tree National Park is a meeting ground between the low-lying western reach of the Sonoran Desert and the more vegetated High Mojave Desert. The merging deserts give the park a unique landscape, with an abrupt transition between the Sonoran and Mojave ecosystems. Joshua Tree offers visitors a variety of outdoor activities, including the typical hiking, biking, camping, and horseback riding. There are large boulders throughout the park that make it a well-known rock climbing destination, and the night skies provide crystal clear stargazing. The natural beauty of the park is a key factor in its popularity. But despite all the beauty found in Joshua Tree, inexplicable things have been known to happen here, some of which are truly horrifying. Let's look at local legends, disappearances, and survival stories from Joshua Tree National Park. First up, Desert Dungeon. In the depths of Joshua Tree National Park, there's a strange cave, which is actually an enclosure constructed around a large boulder and sealed with an iron door. There are long enduring legends attached to this cave. Some people think perhaps it was where local farmers stored dynamite. Others theorize it was where rustlers or gold thieves kept their loot. The energy it radiates, however, is much more sinister. Darker, more disturbing legends exist, probably rooted in truth about the cave being used to hold people captive. One story with many versions maintains that a local family had borne a horribly disfigured and mentally impaired son who was huge and monstrous. The family hid him away from society by locking him up in this rock and iron desert dungeon. The father would bring him food, but the poor soul spent his days and nights a prisoner. Growing tired of this miserable existence, the disfigured man broke out of his prison and fled, leaving the iron door ajar for his father to find upon his return. Searching far and wide, the father couldn't find his son. Reports and rumors began to surface about random, brutal attacks on travelers who sustained injuries like they were surrogates being punished for someone else's horrible misgivings. The legend holds that the tortured man was never caught and he, or whatever's left of him, could still be out there today, roaming Joshua Tree, looking for unsuspecting travelers to make them atone for his father's sins. Next up, we have the Yucca Man. The first reported sighting of the Yucca Man happened in 1971, provided by a source not normally keen on believing in the otherworldly. A United States Marine was on guard duty at the base in Joshua Tree's 29 Palms. Well into his overnight shift, the Marine was keeping post as duty required when a huge and seemingly human man came out of the darkness toward him. As the burly being drew closer, the Marine caught sight of the man's excessive hair growth and his abnormally long arms, which hung well below the knees. The Marine lifted his rifle and gave an order to halt, but then the strange man lunged forward and snatched the rifle away, surprising the Marine and knocking him off stance. He was startled, but caught himself and watched as the wild man bent the metal rifle barrel in half with his bare hands. The broad-shouldered beast of a man gave a grunt and then knocked the Marine unconscious, perhaps with the butt of his own weapon. When he came to, the giant man was gone, but his disfigured gun lay next to him. Even so, the Marine couldn't move. The blow he sustained had caused a lot of damage. He lay there half-conscious until the next morning, when he was found by the relief guard. Reportedly, both the CIA and the FBI were brought in to investigate, as this wasn't the only incident to be reported. There were at least two other sightings that same night. One report described the man as being nearly 12 feet tall, but with a smaller, unknown figure by its side. Several people also reported that their dogs had barked and acted strangely that evening. In the same year, there were reports from employees at Joshua Tree stating they had also seen the large hairy figure. In 1979, 
a couple on a trip to Joshua Tree said they were forced to slam on the brakes in their car one night when what they described as a large hairy man stood in the middle of the road near their condominium in Desert Hot Springs. They recalled that he just stepped from behind a yucca bush and stood in front of the car, refused to move. The couple claimed the creature's hairy chest was the size of a refrigerator and its arms were abnormally long. Sounds familiar. It had lengthy tan hair that swished back and forth as it walked away and disappeared into the night, but only after frightening them senseless. Evidence was left behind at yet more Yucca Man sightings in 1979 in Hemet, California. This beast, seen on two separate occasions, this being left behind 17 footprints that were said to be a foot and a half long, spanning six feet apart. Two prominent Bigfoot researchers worked the area looking for further information, but nothing more has surfaced. Skinwalkers Stories of skinwalkers inhabiting the Joshua Tree area date back many centuries. The Native American Navajo tribe first experienced these beings several hundred years ago, calling them Yi Nagaloshi, meaning he who walks on all fours. The legend of the skinwalkers hold forth that they are actually human shapeshifters that were once shamans of the Navajo tribe. The shamans who used their gifts for evil, like hurting or cursing people, were turned into skinwalkers, able to take the form of various animals, like fox, birds, or coyotes. The Navajo people tried to keep their existence from becoming known to the outside world, but over a century ago, weird and often terrifying things began happening to outsiders in Joshua Tree. So terrifying, in fact, that some Navajo people refuse to this day to speak of the skinwalkers for fear of drawing them to them. Campers, visitors, and other travelers have reported being attacked and often taunted by these beings. Some campers have claimed that when a skinwalker is near, it's like they're being drawn toward whatever the creature is mimicking. Skinwalker attacks are sometimes even deadly, with evil beings sinking their teeth into human flesh and ripping people apart. Those who live to tell the tale of a skinwalker attack are never the same, and they always carry scars, both of the physical and psychological varieties. Next, let's look at some strange disappearances from Joshua Tree National Park. Paul Miller, 51 years old, disappeared on July 13, 2018 in Joshua Tree National Park. He was on vacation with his wife, Stephanie, at the time of his disappearance. They were traveling in celebration of their 26th wedding anniversary. Backwoods camping, hiking, and kayaking were typical pastimes for the couple. They were in great shape and loved the outdoors. Paul last spoke with his wife when he told her that he was going out for one last hike in the park. He planned on hiking the popular 49 Palms Oasis Trail before they were to begin their journey back to Ontario, Canada. He left their hotel room around 9 a.m. that morning and drove to the trailhead. When Paul didn't return by the hotel checkout time, Stephanie became worried. Around noon, she contacted park officials and a search and rescue mission was launched. Paul's rental car was found where he parked at the trailhead, but he wasn't with it. Rangers hiked the trail looking for him, but to no avail. Paul also didn't have a cell phone on him, but this was not out of the ordinary. The search for Paul continued for five days, with not so much as a trace of evidence surfacing aside from his rental car. The search included over 600 volunteers, multiple agencies, canines, high-tech equipment, and lots of hope, but nothing was found. Park Superintendent David Smith said, We have a witness who saw Paul at the trailhead that morning, but that's all. Another visitor from England that was at the park that morning reported seeing Paul at around 9 a.m., walking quickly and with purpose about halfway down the trail. No other sightings were reported. However, on December 21, 2019, NPS authorities and San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department reported that human remains had been found in a remote and rocky part of Joshua Tree. Officials stated the discovery came about through photographs taken by a drone flyover of the area in November. On December 20, park rangers hiked to the area where they found human skeletal remains and personal belongings. There was no identification with the remains, which appeared to have been there for quite some time. Upon the discovery of these remains, the Miller family prepared themselves for the likelihood that those belonged to Paul. It's been a tough journey, waiting, waiting, waiting. 
Then you hear he's been found. It doesn't make it any easier, Stephanie Miller said in a phone interview. Speculation is that whatever happened that caused his death happened quickly, she said. Possibly a heart attack or heat stroke. He was found in a shaded area and still had water and food. It appeared he had made the hike to 49 Palms Oasis, but was coming back from trail the wrong way. Early in the search for Paul, teams had gotten close enough to where the remains were found that he would have heard and responded when they called out his name, she said, adding, There is comfort knowing he didn't suffer long. I hated to think he was suffering and we couldn't find him. As of January 19th, 2022, time of this recording, Paul Miller's case has no further updates. Another disappearance in Joshua Tree was that of William Michael Iwasco. 65-year-old William Michael Iwasco, known as Bill, disappeared on June 24, 2010, from Joshua Tree National Park while on a day hike. Bill lived in Marietta, Georgia, along with his fiancée, Mary Winston. Bill was a strong hiker with experience in the wilderness, and he had loved Joshua Tree for a long time and visited the park almost yearly. He was an Army veteran who had served in Vietnam, and he loved to be outdoors. It was on a Wednesday, June 23, 2010, when Bill arrived at LAX from Georgia. He rented a white Chrysler Sebring and drove to Rancho Mirage, California. Bill was staying at a friend's vacant condo on this particular trip. On Thursday, the 24th of June, he headed for Joshua Tree, making a couple of calls along the way. Bill told his fiancée, Mary, that he planned on leaving the park by 5 p.m. and was going to have dinner that evening at the Pioneer Town restaurant, Happy and Harriet's. Mary believed that Bill was planning to hike to a place called Carrie's Castle, which was the first item on the planned itinerary he had left with her. That would have been an ambitious hike for the time of year, though, due to the high temperatures in the lower portion of Joshua Tree. Mary was uncomfortable with the destination choice due to its remoteness and had asked him to reconsider. Bill just laughed it off and gave no indication he was changing his mind. When Bill failed to call Mary that evening, she grew concerned and began making calls. Early the next day, Friday, June 25, Joshua Tree officials had been notified of the incident and were given a description of Bill's vehicle along with his itinerary. By mid-morning, rangers had checked the trailhead for Carey's Castle, but found no vehicles. They began checking other areas of the park, but it wasn't until 4.56 p.m. on Saturday, June 26, that a California Highway Patrol copter spotted Bill's vehicle parked at the Juniper Flats trailhead, which is a regular starting point for visitors wanting to hike to the top of Quail Mountain, a destination also listed on Bill's itinerary. A ranger stayed with Bill's car overnight just in case he came back, but he never showed. There was one known visitor to Juniper Flats Trailhead on the day Bill disappeared, a hiker named Greg Mendoza. At the time of his arrival, around 10.20 a.m., there was no one else at the trailhead, but upon his return between 5.30 and 6 p.m., he saw Bill's car. He also saw a single line of fresh boot tracks going up the old Juniper Flats Road. This means that Bill's car had arrived at the parking lot no earlier than 10.20 a.m., leaving, at minimum, a near two-and-a-half-hour gap from his last phone call. It should have only taken Bill about half that time to reach Juniper Flats Trailhead, so it's unknown where Bill was for the extra hour or so. By this point, an official search and rescue operation began, focusing mainly on Quail Mountain, but also involving other areas that he could have accessed from the Juniper Flats Trailhead. The official search continued until July 5, 2010, 11 days after Bill's disappearance, and involved hundreds of search and rescue personnel. Included in these search and rescue teams from all over Southern California were canine units, horseback riders, civilian volunteers, helicopters, and a fixed-wing aircraft. In total, about 770 miles of GPS tracks from ground searchers were logged. Only a red bandana believed to belong to Bill was found on the ridge near Quail Mountain throughout all these efforts. The unofficial search continued on despite the lack of evidence. Even with many people being involved after the official search ended, as of this recording in January of 2022, Bill Owasco remains missing and there have been no further updates. Lauren Cho Lauren L. Cho disappeared on June 28, 2021 from the area between Morongo and Yucca Valleys in California. 
Lauren grew up in Hunterdon County, New Jersey, and went by the nickname L. She studied music education at Westminster Choir College and became a high school music teacher. However, L quit her teaching job in the winter of 2020. She then joined her friend Cody Oral on a road trip cross country. She joined this trip with the intention of running a food truck once they arrived at their final destination, Bombay Beach, California. By June 2021, Elle was working as the private chef for an Airbnb property called The Hole, owned by Tao Ruspoli. The property is located between Yucca and Morongo Valleys outside of Joshua Tree National Park. On June 28, 2021, Elle took off on her own after a heated argument ensued between she and her friend Cody. The housekeeper at the Airbnb property claimed that both Elle and Cody had been drinking since early in the day and Elle had become aggravated when Cody refused to let her drive away so she took off on foot, leaving her phone and taking no food or water. This was around 3 in the afternoon. Cody called the sheriff's office around 5.13 p.m. when his initial search rail, which included some of their other friends, came up empty. They didn't find so much as a single footprint. Elle was last seen wearing a yellow t-shirt and blue jean shorts when she walked away from where she was staying. Cody thought she might have gotten into a vehicle with someone, considering there were no tracks, and L was supposedly planning on meeting an unknown individual later in the day anyway, although this theory was never confirmed. Law enforcement officials, as well as search and rescue teams, combed the area on foot and included K-9 rescue teams and a fixed-wing aircraft which was used to conduct aerial searches. The Morongo Basin Sheriff's Station told reporters that their helicopter, along with members of the search and rescue unit, had been searching for L since her disappearance. However, they believe that Elle was voluntarily missing due to no evidence of foul play. The Specialized Investigation Divisions of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department began assisting in the search trail in September of 2021. However, this was a good three months after her disappearance. Despite these efforts, no evidence of her whereabouts came to light. Cody and some of Elle's other friends tried bringing awareness to her disappearance by using social media platforms. They also posted flyers all around the Bombay Beach area, but nothing came of it. No one came forward claiming to have seen Elle. The search continued until October 9, 2021, when investigators found human remains in the rugged terrain of Yucca Valley. On October 28th of 2021, it was confirmed that the remains found did indeed belong to Elle. The cause and manner of her passing have not been released. As of this recording in January of 2022, Lauren Cho's case has no further updates. Next, that brings us to the disappearance of Patrick Lynn Wells. 38-year-old Patrick Wells disappeared on June 5, 2021 from Joshua Tree National Park. Park spokesperson Jenny Alberink stated that Patrick was last seen on June 5th when he left to drive to his dad's house. Patrick was from 29 Palms and he was heading to Riverside. He never made it to his destination and was officially reported missing on June 10. He's described as a Caucasian male, 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighing about 197 pounds. He has brown hair and brown eyes, as well as a dragon and a United States Marine Corps insignia tattoo on his arms. It's believed he was wearing a white t-shirt, blue jeans, and either tennis shoes or black work boots at the time of his disappearance. Park officials found Patrick's truck in the Indian Cove parking lot of the Rattlesnake Canyon area on the day he was reported missing. Joshua Tree National Park began investigating and organized a search. The efforts continued until the search was halted June 12, 2021, on discovery of human remains in a hiking area of Joshua Tree. Soon after, the coroner confirmed the remains belonged to Patrick, though no cause of his passing was listed. As of January 19th, 2021, the date of this recording, there have been no further updates on the Patrick Wells case. Next, we have Erica Ashley Lloyd. 37-year-old Erica Lloyd was last seen on June 14th, 2020 at her home in Walnut Creek, San Bernardino County, California. She told her family she was going on a camping trip to Joshua Tree National Park. Erica's mom, Ruth, said she was just trying to make ends meet, like so many others during the pandemic. Erica owned a salon called Bloom in Alamo, California, 
But when the mandatory closures and other restrictions came about due to the pandemic, Erica's salon closed down and didn't reopen. The trip to Joshua Tree was to be a chance for her to get away from all the negativity for a little while. Erica is described as 5 foot 3 inches tall, 125 pounds, and has brown hair and blue eyes. According to Erica's roommate, she said she was planning to meet other people at Joshua Tree. However, the identities of those people she was supposedly planning to meet are still a mystery, and it's unclear if she did indeed meet up with anyone after leaving home on June 14. When Erica didn't return and couldn't be reached, her family reported her missing on June 17. Authorities found Erica's car, a black 2006 Honda Accord, abandoned on Shelton Road north of State Route 62, just east of the 29 Palms area. Both the front and rear windshields were broken, and the car appeared to be involved in a sand berm accident, which mangled the K-frame of the car and deployed the airbag. Even so, California Highway Patrol Officer Casey Simmons said investigators found no evidence on the roadway consistent with a traffic accident. Some of Erica's items were found in the car, but there was no sign of her whereabouts. The police stated there was no indication of foul play up until the car was found. According to Erica's sister-in-law, Jenna, Erica was very stressed about the pandemic and the quarantine, and she was going camping for a few days to sort of unplug, despite the fact that she was not an experienced camper. The most accurate information about Erica's disappearance can be found on the Bring Erica Home Facebook page. The following is an excerpt from a comment written by Erica's mom on that page. There have been many stories of Erica from various podcasts and in the forum world, which are filled with a lot of opinions, theories, and conjectures. The information that they provide almost never comes from the police investigators handling Erica's case to verify or corroborate their info. We know that Erica was not in a good state of mind and decided to take this trip to Joshua Tree Park to clear her head. There's been no indication of foul play up to when her car was found on Shelton Road, broken down, despite what others may say or think. We received six sightings of apparently homeless or transient women fitting Erica's description in the high desert area, but none of them turned out to be her. Some of what was done to find Erica, there were search teams from the Sheriff's Department that continued to search further and further out from the location of her car, Doug Billings, an expert at mapping and a cave diver, has extensive knowledge of mines in the area. He's done numerous searches with the help of his friends. Family members and other groups have aided in the searching. Banners and a billboard were placed in strategic locations in the Wonder Valley area, asking if anyone helped Erica on June 16th. Erica's aunts have sent out hundreds of flyers to homeless shelters, hospitals, and food banks to areas such as 29 Palms, Joshua Tree, Yucca Valley, Palm Springs, Desert Springs, Indio, Coachella, Riverside, Morongo Basin, Ontario, Los Angeles, San Diego, Venice Beach, and more. Erica's mom further states, We're continuing to look at offbeat communes like Slab City and Amboy. Both police investigators from San Bernardino Sheriff's Department and Walnut Creek Police Department are still actively investigating the case. The case remained active after Erica's disappearance, with no real leads until January of 2021. In February of 2021, Erica's brother posted to the Facebook page saying, As the brother of Erica Lloyd, I would like to address the public on behalf of our family. On January 31st, 2021, human remains were discovered by hikers in the vicinity of Danby Road and Amboy Road in Wonder Valley, California. It is with a heavy heart to announce that these remains have been identified by San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department as my sister, Erica. There is no easy way for me to tell you all this, and there's no easy way for any of us to receive it. My wish is that we can all lean in a little closer, hold each other up, and remind each other more often that we're here for one another with open arms and endless love. It's what she would have wanted. It's the spirit of who she was. On May 12, 2021, Erica's family shared another post on the Bring Erica Home Facebook page. Quoting here, The family of Erica Lloyd would like to give an update. The San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department Special Investigative Unit has notified us they are no longer handling Erica's case. After reviewing the extensive investigation done on Erica's disappearance, they have not found any indication of foul play. Thus, 
Erickson's case will be turned back over to the Morongo Basin Station investigators for any remaining follow-up and information. From everything the investigators learned and everything we found out from our first trip to California in June to our last trip in February, all indications appeared Erica suffered a sudden mental breakdown starting about a week before she disappeared into the desert. During that last week, Erica had communicated with various family members, friends, co-workers, and some clients. The common thread from all of them referring to Erica was something was off and out of place, but they could not put their finger on it. One co-worker was so concerned about Erica on June 10th, six days before she went missing, that she dropped by Erica's apartment to check up on her and spent a couple of hours talking to her. It was the following day when Erica took off on her road trip. It has been hard to understand how Erica, who was a free spirit, hardworking, and an independent, loving mom, could suffer a sudden mental psychotic breakdown. Psychosis means losing touch with reality, as often associated with various serious mental illnesses. If stress becomes too overwhelming, anyone may experience these symptoms triggering a breakdown. Erica was dealing with the lockdown, learning to take care of her son in the new stay-in-place world, a forced shutdown of her thriving Bloom Hair Studio in Alamo, California, losing personal contact with the clients whose weddings and proms were canceled, and trying to make some sense to understand where our society was going. This was overwhelming to her and pushed her over the edge and into a break. Erica was no longer in control, and the voices she heard had taken over her thoughts. As a family, we are heartbroken over losing our Erica. It is difficult to understand what struggles her mind was going through the last week of her life. We know there were possibly missed opportunities to stop and help Erica before she slipped away and wandered out into the desert. At this point, it's unknown if any person or persons could have made a difference in stopping or helping her. We accept what happened to Erica and know she was in the storm of her life. Joshua Tree National Park has a mystical appeal and is said to be located on a powerful energy vortex, and Erica was drawn to this place. Unfortunately, as beautiful as the desert is, the heat is brutal and harsh during the day and cold at night. We know that prior and during this time, Erica was seeking the Lord, looking for peace and happiness in her life. While working with the investigators and searchers, early on, we knew there were three main possibilities of what could have happened to Erica. All were closely looked at, but sadly on June 16th, 2020, Erica was running, it was hot, she was scared, dehydrated, and not in touch with the reality. She wandered into the desert and succumbed to the elements. We know Erica is at peace now. Because of Erica's faith in God, he has a bigger plan for her which gives us comfort. This is our hope. The Lord Jesus Christ brought Erica home. End quote. Any updates that the family wishes to share in the future will be posted on the Facebook page titled Bring Erica Home. Now, on a lighter note, not everybody that goes missing in Joshua Tree perishes. Here are some amazing true stories of survival. Claire Nelson. 36-year-old Claire Nelson nearly died alone in the desert in May of 2018. Claire, originally from New Zealand, was visiting friends who lived near Joshua Tree National Park where she was to house sit for them while they left for vacation. During her stay... Claire planned on adventuring through the desert and connecting with nature. Claire was experienced in the outdoors, and she was a fiercely independent person, so much so that she had been pushing people away for some time. But she loved exploring and also sharing her travel experiences online. She was a freelance travel writer at the time of the Joshua Tree visit that changed her life forever. After her friends left for their journey to Scotland, Claire was on to her own adventures. She left for a day hike to Joshua Tree, planning to explore the Lost Palms Oasis Trail. However, Claire hadn't told anybody specifically where she was going, only that she planned on exploring inside Joshua Tree. It started out as a day like any other. Claire packed a day bag with a spare t-shirt, several liters of water, and a meager lunch. A hard-boiled egg, a bagel, and a chocolate bar. She also carried other items that were usually not essential for just a few hours outdoors, but later proved life-saving, 
a plastic bag, a bandana, a park map, and sunscreen. With her day pack in place, Claire drove to Joshua Tree and parked. It was hot, but Claire was confident and enjoying herself in the beauty of the desert. She was a ways into her hike when she unknowingly wandered off the designated trail and began following a dry riverbed, and there was a boulder she had to climb on the path she was traveling. She climbed up, then began testing her footing. Everything seemed okay until her foot started slipping, and she became unsteady. She lost her balance completely and went crashing over 26 feet down into a clearing not much bigger than she was, shattering her pelvis in the process. The fall knocked the breath out of her, and the pain was excruciating and unrelenting. Claire recalled, I'd landed amongst these large boulders, and I couldn't move. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't stand up. It was indescribably painful. Unable to move, Claire immediately tried using her cell phone to call for help, but she had no service. The predicament she was in was life-threatening, indeed. She was all alone in the desert with a shattered pelvis, barely enough water for a day and a half, and contending with the California desert heat, as well as unusually high numbers of coyote, rattlesnakes, and other dangers. I felt more vulnerable than I could ever have imagined being in my life, Claire said of the ordeal. She immediately began recording videos of herself, messages to friends and family, as well as documentation of her situation. Claire occasionally tried to move, especially to find shade, but when she tried, there was a crunching, clicking sound coming from her pelvic region, along with searing, mind-numbing pain. She couldn't budge. She was ashamed to admit it, but this hike was not the first time she'd left for an adventure without telling someone of her plans. I know better. I know the rules. Always tell someone where you're going, said Claire, who wrote about her experience in her book, Things I Learned from Falling. The reality of her situation set in, and Claire really didn't want to spend the night alone on the desert floor, but she had no other option. Nobody knew to check in with her or to expect her back at a certain time. The fact that she might die out there alone was not lost on Claire. She kept recording videos, then turning her phone and digital camera off to conserve the battery life. She made herself eat the hard-boiled egg since it would go bad anyway, and she knew she needed the protein if she was going to survive this tragedy. Her determination and will to live kicked in, however, and Claire prepared herself for the nighttime. After nightfall, there were bats flying around, and Claire hoped they weren't the kind that liked to bite people. Her imagination went wild, and she was sure at times that she was seeing snakes coming out of the rocks, though in reality, snakes rarely come out at night. Thankfully, she survived until morning. One night in the desert, alone and injured, down. Only two more to go. Claire tried her best to protect herself from the elements. She used a stick to rub sunscreen on her legs. The sun is unforgiving during the desert summers and can quickly do significant damage to her skin, as well as dehydrate us even faster. She rationed what was left of her food and water as long as she could, but neither lasted very long. The lack of water grew unbearable. Dehydration is a god-awful business, Claire wrote in her book. It starts in the mouth, the initial pang of craving quite subtle and easy to ignore, but the signals get more insistent. Over time, your tongue becomes increasingly dry and scratchy, thickening like a woolen mitten, sticking against the sides of your mouth like Velcro. From there, you feel it in your head. A slowly increasing pressure throbs inside your skull, as if your brain is shrinking in on itself, withering like a piece of dried fruit. She fantasized about Diet Coke and other cold refreshments, even willing them to be real. Claire had no choice once her water ran out. She even urinated in a bottle and drank it for hydration. While unpleasant, at least it helped keep her alive. She used the park map, the bandana, and the plastic bag, which she attached to a stick, to cover herself and block out the sun. Claire continued applying sunscreen, recycling her urine and making videos, but there was nothing else she could do. She was trapped in the middle of the desert with no way of knowing whether anyone was searching for her. She battled the scorching heat on the second day and dreaded nightfall. She didn't want to spend another night alone in the desert. Naturally, she hadn't slept and delirium was setting in. 
She made it through the night with sheer willpower and determination. On the third day, Claire's mind was really playing tricks on her. She thought she heard helicopters and ambulances, but it was all in her head. She could see birds of prey circling overhead, waiting for her to die so they could grab an easy meal. However, after a couple of days of social media silence, the friends Claire was house-sitting for grew concerned. It wasn't like her not to post, especially when she was somewhere beautiful like Joshua Tree. They contacted friends from the area and had them go to the house to check for Claire. When they didn't see her car or find her at the home, Claire was reported missing. Joshua Tree National Park officials found her car, and there were at least two days of chalk marks, which are used to tell whether or not a vehicle has been moved. It was clear that Claire had left the car and not come back for quite some time. A search and rescue mission was launched. The searchers starting where her car was found and working outwards. They made several rounds in a helicopter near where Claire had fallen, but they didn't find her at first. After all, she was trapped between large boulders where it was difficult to see. They called out over the helicopter's PA system, We are looking for a missing hiker. If you can hear us, please make movement. The search crew didn't know it, but Claire was screaming for help as she heard the helicopter, and it was real this time. She tied the plastic bag on the end of her stick with a hair tie and began waving it frantically. It wasn't until their last and final sweep of the area that they saw, tiny and obscure, a plastic grocery bag waving back and forth. They called out that they could see her and told her that help was on the way. Due to the terrain, the helicopter couldn't land in the area, so rescuers had to hike into where she was at to save her. Claire knew at that point that she was going to be okay. After three nights and four days alone in the desert, Claire was rushed to a hospital where she received emergency surgery. Thankfully, she made it through okay and spent the next several months recuperating. She had to do extensive rehabilitation and spend some time in a wheelchair before she was able to learn to walk again. During her time in that awful situation, Claire realized that she had been pushing people away, and although she was connecting with others in social media, there was a lack of true human connection in her life. She made the decision that if she lived through this ordeal, she was going to do better for herself and for others. Claire triumphantly returned to Joshua Tree a year later with friends and finally finished the hike she had started that almost ended her life. Today, Claire is thankful to be alive and she vowed to never forget what happened to her and to use it as motivation. Her book, Things I Learned from Falling, can be found on Amazon. Next up in our survivors, Holly Jokum. 32-year-old Holly Jokum was planning a camping trip on December 27, 2020 to Big Bear Campground in California. She packed her things and loaded her two dogs into her RV. As she drove to Big Bear, she was excited for the trip, but unfortunately, when she arrived, she found the campsite was closed. Around 4.45 p.m. that day, she contacted family and told them about a change of plans. She was going to drive an hour and 15 minutes away and camp in the desert at Joshua Tree instead and said she'd call when she arrived. But by 7.30 that evening, Holly's phone was off or otherwise unreachable and her family hadn't heard from her. They were rightfully concerned and contacted the authorities. They filed a missing person report and began reaching out on social media for help locating Holly. Her sister, Lori, made a post asking for anyone who might have seen Holly to please come forward. Holly had randomly selected a campsite at Joshua Tree from her phone. Although she was an experienced camper, the site she chose was unfamiliar to her. On the way to the site, the terrain had become difficult and she decided to camp out in a secluded area until the next day. The night came and went, and the next morning, Holly woke to find two feet of snow had fallen through the night. Holly wrote about the ordeal. By Tuesday, there was nearly two feet of very fine, fresh powder, and I was stuck. There was also no cell service where she had parked, so she and her two dogs were truly out there alone. For three days, Holly and the dogs camped out, waiting for the snow to melt, but that never happened. Holly decided she had to do something. Friday morning, she planned on hiking back down the mountain, at least until she had cell service. 
the snow was too deep for her dogs, so she loaded them into two separate backpacks and began the six-mile hike back down. Eventually, she reached a place that had phone service, and she called in her location to her mom and the authorities. Search teams had been looking for her, and news of her safety was cause for celebration. Holly met the sheriff at the bottom of the mountain, who drove her to Cabazon, where she met with her mother. Thankfully, neither Holly nor her dogs were harmed during their time stuck on the mountain, and they had a happy ending, unlike so many others who go missing. Holly wrote, I'm so thankful for everyone who was involved in searching for me, for everyone who shared the missing persons post, and mostly for my family, who tried with every ounce they had to bring me back. The experience is sure to remind Holly, as well as the rest of us, of the dangers of the wilderness and just how quickly things can change when you're at the mercy of Mother Nature. And our last tale of survival, Robert Ringo. 67-year-old Robert Ringo was on a day hike one Thursday in June of 2020 near Quail Mountain in Joshua Tree National Park when tragedy struck. Robert had gotten ready that morning with nothing out of the ordinary. He drove to Joshua Tree and, once parked, shared his location with his son, something he always did. He brought along two liters of water for the hike, but not much more in the way of supplies. The temperatures are in the high 90s. The desert heat was sweltering. Robert is an avid hiker and used to these conditions, so he wasn't worried, especially since he was only planning a short hike. He felt good starting out on his walk, but a ways into the hike, while admiring the views and enjoying the outdoors, Robert somehow lost his footing and fell to the ground, breaking his left femur. The area he was in had no cell service, so he was stranded after his fall. I started trying to at least turn over, and when I did, he said, it was just unbelievable pain. Robert began recording himself since he had no way of signaling for help. His cries for help can be heard in the videos shared with news media. Robert knew his two liters of water wouldn't last for long. He tried to at least get himself onto his back and finally managed. After some time lying there, he knew he had to eat something to keep his energy up. I somehow scooted up this place, ate some juniper berries, and saw what I thought might be flowers, but they were all dry, so I wasn't going to eat them, he said. He continued recording videos and trying to conserve water. This is the first time I've experienced no saliva, he said in one of the videos he took. He knew if he could just hold on long enough, someone would be looking for him. He mentions having a confidence and a faith that he was going to survive. The next day, Friday, Robert's son Ryan alerted officials of his father's missing status. He saw on his phone that his dad's last known location was Joshua Tree. The search and rescue efforts began searching in earnest for Robert, knowing the summer heat is dangerous to be in with only limited water supply. Time was of the essence. Rescue teams searched for hours, but to no avail. It wasn't until Saturday morning nearly two days after Robert had taken his fall, that he finally heard a rescue copter. The Joshua Tree search and rescue team retrieved Robert and brought him to the Desert Regional Medical Center. Robert had emergency surgery on his leg and later made a full recovery. In closing, it's things like we've covered in this video that continue to happen daily, with our national parks being hotspots for all manner of strange occurrences some of them natural, some of them bordering on the supernatural and beyond. While there could be any number of things or a combination of things to blame for these cases, one thing is certain. We can never be sure something won't happen to us. It's recommended that everyone who plans on being within our national parks or out in the wilderness in general carry a personal locator beacon at all times. This beacon transmits a distress signal with its location when activated. So what do you think is happening in Joshua Tree? Let us know in the comments section. And if we've earned your subscription, we appreciate it. Please hit the red button and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out on any new content or case updates. I look forward to your comments, but ask that you please keep them friendly and respectful. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and I'll see you just a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton and I'll talk to you next time.